Hey guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review and today's game up on the tabletop is Soul Shards Grand Tourney, a 2-4 to four player worker placement slash D&D role playing combat game. This is a game by Grinning Demon, takes roughly about an hour and a half to play and is for ages 13 and up and in the game Soul Shards you're going to be choosing a character. Here I have Traz. My character is going to come with a standee, a base, as well as I'm utilizing dice, he's a 12 sided dice and he's going to be a worker for the first portion of the game. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to get their worker, or their character, which they will move around the board to the trainer, the quest board, the inn, the different guild halls, maybe fighting a monster in the arena, gaining new characters in the tavern called mercenaries, and of course suiting your character up with armor and weaponry. You'll go throughout the game placing down your character and or mercenaries on the game board, enacting all the effects from 1 all the way down to 12, and then you'll rinse and repeat throughout the game days. There are a total of 14, and after the 14th day, you're going to have a grand tourney. You and the other players will combat against each other, and the last surviving player is the winner of the game. Let's talk about the setup, how to play, and of course, my review. To set up the game, the first thing you do is you take the main game board out and place it within reach of all players. This is the place in which you're going to be gathering new equipment and new mercenaries, as well as joining the guild halls and fighting monsters. When the game board is out, you're going to take each of the decks, or individual decks for each of the locations with decks present. You'll shuffle those cards up and place them in their slots. One for each of the guild halls, one for the monster arena, the mercenaries that are going to be at the tavern, and your items that will go to the armory. The decks are shuffled and placed, and then you're going to deal out cards. Face down monsters for the arena, four of them total, and then for the armory, there'll be four face up equipment cards that you can utilize. Take the sun tracker, this is the tracker for the rounds, it will indicate how long the game is going to go up until you're going to fight each other, and place it on the one, and set aside all the rest of the components. There's going to be upgrade components, there's going to be cubes that you'll utilize for various things, as well as extra dice, and your initiative slash like the way in which you determine who starts and who ends combat. Place that board somewhere within reach of all players. The monster dice are red, and there's going to be monster tokens, or monster little like, clips that you'll use to track the monster health. Place that somewhere within the arena or on the side of the game board, as well as your extra mercenary pawns, and their big deck o monsters. The D&D aspect of the game, where you're going to be fighting monsters, you'll get to know about their story, and of course, you'll secretly have to fight them, meaning one of the players will know all the information, and you won't as you fight the monster. Go ahead and place see somewhere face down within reach of all players because everyone will be using them to fight against monsters. Each player is also going to get a player reference board. It's a large board that explains your zone effects and the fight notes for how to fight in combat. You're going to choose a character. Each player will. And after you choose your character, you're going to take the character and the standee base. And all base is associated with that color. I chose blue and I'm choosing Taz. I'm also going to go ahead and take the blue deck of cards. This is the cards you'll use in combat. They're going to be Defend, Focus, Lure, Balance, Primary, and Second. Take your uh, initiative tokens. These are where you're going to determine which, uh, in what order of combat you're going to be going in. And then you're going to take three cubes. You're going to place zero for trophies, 17 for HP, and six for souls. Take the four dice of your color, and then finally place the combat track somewhere within reach of at least one player or multiple players. It'll get passed around the game board. Uh, from there, you're basically ready to begin the game. Everything's basically set up. Uh, extra characters have unique special abilities and grant you unique uh, aspects to them. And if you're not playing first, you're actually going to gain one trophy to start the game off. Okay. That's it, let's go ahead and get into how to play the game. Soul Shard's Grand Tourney is played in rounds, and each round is going to consist of players placing one of their pawns out onto one of the many locations on the game board. I place one, you place one, Bill, and then Tom. I place one, you place one, rinse and repeat from there. Once everybody has placed out their characters, then from order going from 1 to 12, you will establish each of the unique abilities of these locations and you'll do them, whether it be fighting monsters, gaining equipment, visiting the guilds, quest board, tavern, etc, etc. And after you've completed all of these things, then you'll have the option to leave your characters on the space or to return those characters and put them back onto your board for later use on the next round. And there's an end of game or end of round tracker where you're going to move to the next day and you'll reset certain things. Monsters may flip over and may move around the game board, etc, etc, up until the 14th slot. When you get to the last, the last round of the game, you're going to be entering into a combat in which you're going to fight against another player, 
and then if there are four players, that other player will fight against that other player. And then if there's a winner from each, you'll have those two players fight. You'll reset all their HP and everything, and you'll begin once again, kind of like the start of a new day. So let's talk about how the round works. And the first thing we talk about is placement, right? There are a bunch of different placements. I believe there are 12 in total, and let's go ahead and just cover them all. In fact, there are zone effects that explain what each of these locations do. The first one is City Hall. If you place within the one slot, it's gonna give you the first player marker so that you can go first. You're also gonna be able to roll for wit. Uh, for each six that you roll, uh, or higher, up to twice, you can, um, you can position one card in any zone, and for every 12 or higher, you gain one fame. Fame are your basically usable points that'll let you obtain new mercenaries and you can have certain things will let you spend it, etc, etc. Uh, whereas if you can position a card, you're going to be able to actually, it's basically similar to drawing cards and placing them on the field. As you notice, there are some cards uh, that are from the decks that are not drawn and placed. Positioning a card lets you get rid of cards as well as place new cards out. It's kind of a way to refresh. And of course, with City Hall getting the first player marker, then you go first on the next day. The quest board is the characters and not mercenaries gain two souls, so only characters can do the spot to gain souls. And then you roll any skill, and for each six or higher, you'll gain a soul. And for each 12, you'll gain one more soul. Uh, let's talk about skill rolls. Each of your characters have skills, uh, and there's like agility, strength, and like knowledge, those kind of three, they might call them a little bit different here, but uh, it's green, orange, and blue. For each of the pips that you have, you're going to roll that many dice, up to four. And when you roll, you'll roll these 12-sided die and you'll check to see the result. Most of the time, each of them individually matters or just the highest roll will matter. I have a five and a nine. If it called for a six or higher, I would gain the bonus of that nine and I would not get anything for the five. And so that's how you're gonna be utilizing things for uh, those rolls for whether it be wit for the city hall um, or being able to roll for any skill at the quest board. Then there's the trainer zone. This is the place in which you can roll any skill and you must roll four times the tier, and on a success, you can pay souls equal to that tier, and you can look at the tier and see the cost of the souls, uh, and that'll actually give you an extra skill. You'll actually use these little skill tokens to increase your skill, and you'll place them down. So you can go from two to three, and three to four, or one to two, just depending on what your skill is. So you'll basically be rolling to increase your ability to roll additional dice for different things, whether it be combat, or the ability to gain new items or guild items. Uh, then we're going to go move on to the next area, which is the guild halls. So there's zones four to six. When you place your character here and it activates, you're going to actually be able to position two cards. You'll draw, basically you'll be drawing cards, placing them on the field here, and then you'll roll for the guild skill. Uh, on a six or a higher, you obtain one card in that zone. And if you roll a 12 or higher, you can pay a soul to gain an extra card. And these have a variety of different things that they can do for you, whether it is an item that lets you deal damage and cause wounds, or gain plus two on all of your strength rolls, or block one non-magical damage, etc., etc. These can be cards that are like passive abilities or an item in which you can use. And each of the guilds kind of functions a little differently and has the symbol of what skill is required. And there, as you can see, there's the green, orange, and blue. After you've talked about the guild hall, so you're gonna to go to the armory. The armory is a place in which you can place your character and buy equipment. You can buy any number of equipments, but you have to pay soul, and the soul cost is on the bottom left. This dagger that does three damage is gonna cost you one soul, whereas something like the dragon scale armor is gonna cost you five. It's pretty powerful because it blocks two uh, magical damage. Uh, then we'll move on to the arena zone. The arena zone is where you're gonna be fighting monsters. Uh, and how this works for these, a singular player is they'll be able to look at all the monsters here that are face down and put the back face down, choose one of them, and they can fight the monster. If there's multiple players, those players can work together cooperatively to fight the monster. Let's talk about combat. Combat in this game is similar to D&D style combat in which you're going to first determine who has the like, initiative who starts off the game. And in fact, it's, it's called accuracy. Um, but basically, whoever has the higher uh, tier, whether it be the monster's level or your uh, trophies, is going to be the one that goes first, or has like the, uh, not goes first, they have the win on ties, basically. In which case, after that, the players will actually take two cards from their hand. Like I said, there's the defend, focus, lure, balance, primary, secondary, etc., etc. You'll choose two of these cards and you'll place them face down. The monster is going to be given to one other random player. So if it was the Shining Butterfly, for instance, this is a really strong one. Well, it's rank three. Uh, the player is actually going to roll uh, one, of their D one of the monster's D12s, 
and then they're going to check to see what they got. They got a six, that means it's a mind break. You don't actually, if you're playing as the monster, just you're kind of like, you're not as the monster, but you're playing for the other player with the monster in tow, you will actually say, okay, this is a five for um, accuracy, which means you'll place the monster on five. And then the player will reveal their cards and they'll choose, in this case, a primary and secondary. They'll choose items that reference the primary and secondary, meaning they can choose like an item from their equipment or special attack or whatever. And they'll assign their priority as well. This is a six and the other one might be a five, in which case I'd take my two tokens and place it on six and five. And then from there, you'll initiate combat. You'll go from the highest to the lowest. And of course, monster will win on ties for who goes first and you will do what the cards say. Uh, in one case, it might be do two damage and cause two rounds of uh, minus one damage. So I'll have to actually roll my strength, which is two dice, versus my uh, the monster's defense in speed. And the monster's defense in speed is 10. I roll the 12, I hit, I do two damage. And then the monster might be doing something like mind break. Mind break is gonna be a, this looks like a magical wisdom and they will roll one two dice and they'll I'll check my defense this is a five and a 12 in magic which is eight so 12 is higher than eight thusly I'm going to take three damage and there's gonna be four rounds of where I'm gonna get minus one on rolls and you'll track the monster's HP here on the left hand side of the, of the card here the whole card here illustrates the name of the monster the rank of the monster and how many trophies you'll get if you defeat it it explains the HP of the monster four attacks that can happen in each round you're gonna be rolling a die to determine what new attack that monster might be doing. Uh, the stats of the monster, as well as the defense, depending on that stat. The unique passive ability here, which is this one, it says increases each character's accuracy by two and has a plus one to defense. And then the bottom is if it's fighting more than one player, it'll say one, highest to priority action remaining uh, remaining in this round. I mean, that's the player who's gonna attack. And then the next, next highest is last to cause injury to this character. And so it's gonna go back and forth, round, around, around. If this monster defeats you, you're gonna actually kind of have to, you'll, you'll basically be out. You'll have to go into, I believe it's the inn, you'll refresh kind of thing um, and lose your turn. Whereas if you defeat the monster, you're gonna get your rewards, which is gonna be trophies equal to the monster's level, as well as the monster's specific card, which usually provides some passive benefit. If multiple players are playing against it, then the other players are gonna get the trophies plus additional trophies equal to half rounded down of the monster's level. And that's how you fight monsters. Uh, then the next area is gonna be the tavern here. The tavern is where you pick up mercenaries. Uh, mercenaries are up to twice, you can position two cards. You'll be flipping these two cards over. You got a Pergy and you got Barber. And then you can pay two souls and obtain one card in the zone. In order to do that though, you actually have to have trophies equal to each of your slots. You can have three total mercenaries. These are cards that characters will help you in combat as well as being placed down on the board as additional meeples, as like workers. And they also have these unique effects on them. So, okay, this one here, maybe I want Pergy. I'd spend my soul, I have to have the requirements for them and I could place it down in my slot as long as I had three trophies. And like I said, three slots, it requires three, six, and then nine trophies to have these guys here. The next space is the inn. The inn is a way in which you can heal yourself. You can fully heal, you'll gain one fame, uh, and then for mercenaries, you don't heal. And I think those are the main, so it's 10 areas, those are the main 10 areas. Players will place their characters, then you'll go from one all the way to 10, checking to see in the order what things and events will happen. And then you will choose to return characters. In fact, I'll explain the return right here. It's the end of the day. If it's day 14, meaning this is the 14th time you've done this, you're gonna move on to the grand tournament. Otherwise, you'll discard any escaped monster from the inn. You'll roll a die for each face-up monster in the arena. Uh, and from there, uh, if the roll is six or higher, the monster escapes interrupting the current gameplay and increasing the number needed to escape by two for each pawn in the arena. If there are any face down monsters in the arena, you'll roll one die. And if it's six or higher, you'll turn down the face up, face down monster who's lowest in the area here, which is gonna be cage one. Uh, you discard any one card on the shelf one in the armory. So kind of like refreshes cards in the armory. Uh, and then you can also place cards into each open space in the armory face up and the arena face down from the zones deck, which means these arena and armory areas will always be filled with cards as opposed to like the guild hall and the tavern where you actually have to re-add re cards and remove cards. 
Uh, then you'll advance the day by one, and then you'll start the next day by dis dispatching pawns. Now, when recalling your pawns, uh, you'll often have, you can choose to like remove them from the board and put them back, kind of like a worker placement, or not. Typically speaking, you're always going to want to remove your pawns to replace them again, but there are three reasons why you might not want to do that. One is if a monster escapes the zone you're in, you can actually fight that monster if they try to escape. You can prevent another player from dispatching to a zone because zones can only have characters equal to the number of players in them. And you cannot be locked out of the zone by other players, meaning as long as you're at the zone, you can place warriors on that zone. And so there you go. That's the basic idea of the game. Placing your workers out in turn order, completing each of these different areas in turn order, gathering items, fighting monsters, working with the guilds, increasing your different skill effects, and then the grand tourney where players fight against each other. And like I said, combat simple. Taking two cards from your hand, placing them face down, and then revealing them, setting your priority, and then doing the combat. And eventually, as these cards get discarded, you're going to get to ha you're going to have to, or you can choose to earlier, focus, which lets you return all the cards you previously played back to your hand. So you're not always going to be able to attack each and every time you play these cards, uh, or you have to attack just a little bit and do defenses. Each of them kind of function in a different way as far as combat goes. And based on how powerful your character is, is how more, more useful these cards are going to be, because these cards just reference the cards in which you've gained or the abilities which you currently have. Okay, well, I think you get the basic idea of the game. It is a combat D&D style game mixed in with a worker placement. What do I think about it? Soul Shard's Grand Tourney is a worker placement combat style game, and it does this quite well. There's a few games that kind of fit this genre, but what makes this one unique is the D&D slash role-playing aspect of the game. The main aspect of the game that I found the most unique was the fact that when you fought monsters, you'll be able to choose them when you go to the arena. You can send your character to this arena over here, look at the monsters, select one to fight, and then you can be like, oh, I'm going to choose to fight the slime. It's a level one, right? Well, the character to your left is the one who gets to read this or write. It really doesn't matter. They're going to read the unique story about what the slime is, flip the card over, and they're not going to show you. They're the DM for this specific encounter. The slime will have a certain number of HP. You don't know that. Have certain stats. And you can kind of guess based on like what a slime has or a skeleton or a shining butterfly, as well as a unique passive and then a number of abilities as well as targeting. Targeting is only relevant when there's more than one player fighting in the arena. And that does happen, especially when you're playing more than two players. Each of these abilities are unique. Some of them can be stuff like charging up my lasers or firing my lasers or doing things like, like the special ailments or effects that will trigger and take place. There's a unique combat board which you can utilize as well, which will illustrate specific things happening like getting bonus attacks for four turns or suffering an injury every turn for like a burn effect or minus one on all your rolls your priority being reduced, and of course, taking minus one damage. And so each of the special ailments on each of these characters here can be referenced on this combat board. And once you defeat the monster, which you don't know when it's gonna happen, you could do five damage and the monster's still alive. You're like, how much HP does this have? Oh, it only has six, so I didn't know that, but next round you take care of it. Or it's got a boatload of HP, and each of the monsters are, in fact, different. The only aspect to combat that I dislike a little bit is the fact that you might get a ton of scary monsters on the field that are very difficult to beat. Those monsters will eventually escape and new monsters are going to come out or move around the game board. However, it does suck encountering a arena that is filled with nasty stuff. But most, for the most part, there's a lot of lower end monsters that you can beat. Levels one and two are possible early game and maybe three if you get your rolls right. This is still a D&D game. There's still chance involved in combat, whereas the worker placement aspect is not a chance-based uh, encounters. It's more about fulfilling the character's requests, gaining the ability to kind of combat monsters. You might want to jump into the arena early and hope you get level ones, or you can kind of sit back and wait, gather the resources that you need, gain the mercenaries so that you can then utilize them as extra characters and then go into the arena to gain your rewards. It's really how you want to work it. Do you want to try and push that snowball downhill slowly uh, and gain benefits kind of slowly, slowly, or are you going to pack snow on to like a mound and create this snowball that is then huge. However, you're going to hurt yourself potentially while doing so. It's really kind of up to you how you want to take your uh, chances with this game. The other aspect of the game that's really cool is the unique 
aspect of playing cards for combat, having to utilize only these five cards that illustrate all your character's aspects, whether it be focusing to regain your cards or defending, which gives you immunity to certain effects or ailments this turn, as well as using a card that's not an attack card. Your secondary, that either lets you take the priority token, which lets you win on ties as far as priority goes, or it also will let you play uh, one uh, weapon that involves like the, the hand and shield. It could be like, for instance, Traz here has a crushing breath. Primary lets you basically use whatever you want. The balance is going to give you bonus rolls and priority, and then lure can cause your opponent uh, have no effect for certain aspects that they try to utilize. And that depends. Some monsters don't have effects, so playing certain cards for certain ones are going to do nothing. And you have to kind of base that off of what are available to you and like the knowledge that you have on those kind of monsters in a D&D &D sense. Each character is unique as well. Traz has the ability to do damage and cause rounds of negative damage, as well as overpower. When they hit 12 on a roll, they do an extra damage, and you're also immune to minus one damage. So it's a kind of unique passive. And each character has unique passives. They have unique abilities that you will be utilizing throughout the game. They all have the same kind of, uh, they start with the same amount of trophies and health and whatnot. Um, I think there's a few that have like, I think it's between like 17 and 15 HP, but the main attack and this, the passive is very unique to the character, as well as the stats. This character's got more green and blue, but very little uh, orange, whereas this character here has a ton of orange, almost no green, and a little bit of blue. They all have a total of six stats arranged between the characters, so it's all balanced. It's just based on what the character is good at doing, and you can kind of focus on where it's weak to kind of balance the character out in the game, or you can pound heavy on what it's good at to make it even better, increase its stats up to Four, making it very, very strong, and the defense for that stat very strong as well. The worker placement aspect of the game is pretty cool as well. I like the idea of being able to take first. There's the ability to get additional souls, which you'll use to buy items, the ability to train your skills, each of the guilds kind of working with your character and what it's good at and giving you bonuses to either weaponry or specific effects and passes that the character will need. Mercenaries that are extra workers that are very needed. In fact, they're challenging to get at the beginning, but once you start getting them, these are going to give you bonus actions. Now, mercenaries have limitations. Uh, mercenaries, depending on where they're at, will not take part in every single aspect of a location and how they fight, especially when fighting monsters. Your character will have to go to them. So they're kind of limited. I'm not going to explain all about mercenaries, but they're basically extra workers that have unique effects that can work with you in gaining different spaces, but have limitations presented to them. The inn is a place you're going to go after you fight monsters. It's always going to happen. You're going to have to heal yourself back up because otherwise you're going to have to, you're going to have to suffer damage and you're going to have to kind of kick yourself out for a turn, which is rough. Uh, combat is probably the most complicated aspect to this game. Having to understand how priority works. There's also a priority system where you can choose to like lose priority to gain a benefit at the beginning of the round. The, the rules are kind of vague as to how that works. So I just it was it was also optional, so I just chose not to do it. Um, and then the online rules I wasn't sure as well. So I'm sure that they once they kind of put together the rules and stuff like that and make it a little more cohesive. It'll be easily easier to understand. About 90% of the rules were fairly easy to understand, straightforward, and a little bit of the complication came with combat because combat's fairly mechanical. It's very D&D-esque. Roll the dice, check priority. Roll the dice, check the what abilities you're going to use. Place the cards down, check your abilities. Then, based on order priority, you're going to be rolling dice in order to fight the monster. And based on whether you're the attack or the defender, what number you're going to use, whether it be die rolls or the base stat, you see what I'm saying. Uh, everything else is fairly straightforward. The movements on the locations, how you reveal cards. I love the idea of kind of being able to move the, their like, positioning cards. It's not just draw and place. They now actually do unique aspects as well. They, like, they have a little bit of an extra oomph to them when it comes to placing cards. The arena's fun. The monsters are fun. Combat can be a little long. It's mainly what the aspect of the game is going to be is about combat, especially after you go through all 14 rounds. Depending on how many mercenaries are in there, the game can be quite short in this aspect or quite long. And then the fighting each other. Battling each other is literally going to feel like a D&D &D battle between you and your comrade, where you will work together during the main aspect of the game, which is the worker placement, to get stronger. But then when it's time to brawl, you guys are going to go up against each other. And I like that aspect. I think that's a really unique aspect to the game where you're fighting against each other at the end. I think what would be even cooler, too, is if they included a fully cooperative mode where instead of fighting each other, you can actually have all four of you go up against one big boss monster. That would be excellent. I think there, I know for a fact there are additional elements in the game. Let me see. I didn't actually do the extra bonus stuff, but I'll talk and look at them. There's a draft mode. 
There's a gauntlet mode where all players work to defeat all monsters in the arena. And there is a full cooperative. Uh, play through the worker placement, blah, 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 blah. Reach the grand tourney instead of facing each other's players work to face a, face a rank seven monster. If any character survives the fight, all players win the game. Each character beyond one in the fight. The okay, that's cool. So there is a way in which uh, all I want to see is a big boss monster as opposed to just fighting a seven. There's like one dragon that you got to fight at the very end or something like that. That'd be pretty cool. But they actually do have the element uh, that I think would be pretty cool. I played this game about three times. Yeah, I played this three times. The first time I didn't get all the way through and then the second and third time I did. Um, and the ending is always a climactic aspect to the game fighting against each other. But sometimes my friends would have preferred to not fight that way. I think I probably should have jumped in and tried the cooperative aspect, but overall it was a lot of fun. The artwork um, for the main game board is nice, illustrated well, explains the game and all that. The board is fine. It works okay. Um, the the combat is great. The way initiative works is simple once you understand the basics for understanding the rules. Uh, so, I, yeah, I really do like all the artwork. I think probably only the box cover was what throws me off for this one. Maybe they'll change that. But everything else for the artwork is stylish and cool. I like the main game board aspects, and I like the characters represented on the, uh, on the monsters here. Uh, otherwise, yeah, everything else about the game is a lot of fun. If you're looking for a worker placement game that has this D&D aspect to it, where you're fighting against monsters, working with each other, and then having to come back into this tournament, work against each other, then this is going to be a solid, fun experience for you. This is a prototype. Things are likely to change in the end, so I don't know exactly. I don't come harshly on games that are prototypes because who knows what it's going to look like. You need to look at the campaign for yourself and decide if this is something for you when it comes to art, graphic design, all that, because things definitely change. Trust me, I've seen even Vindication, my first game I ever reviewed that was like a big Kickstarter campaign. It went from one thing to another thing. So look it up for yourself. But otherwise, the gameplay and the idea of D&D crossed between a worker placement is excellent. And this game does a really good job of that, as long as you don't mind going through it and understanding the basics for the first time around. Yep. Uh, solid game. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Soul Shards Grand Tourney. If you're looking for a game like this, the link is down below in the description, currently available to you on Kickstarter. And if you like this video, like the videos we make here on this channel, go ahead and like, comment, and hit that subscribe button, the bell notification button to see more videos just like this one. Additionally, we do a whatnot stream at 5.30, 6.30 on Thursdays, and then we do a live stream on Sundays at 6.30 p.m. PST. You can watch us play games just like this one here. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, I look forward to joining the tourney with you next time. <laughs>